fear only ourselves, for we are slowly turning deaf to what goes on outside of us. Regardless of what we create, it returns to us. It is not necessarily I be right. It reflects an experience that depends on what is tangible and outside of ourselves. Yet we enter the forest and feel the potential of being that which the forest dreams of. Sound burns from within ourselves. Heard sound, not a tone or the many forms of sound, yet it is this sound that guides us to our path without, without external help. How do we first hear ourselves? In the form of endless humming and dancing. Both are still without a name. They do not exist in and of themselves, and nobody has actually formed them. Wherever we encounter them, they move us because of their quality of representing a primordial beginning. Before that, however, it was necessary to work our way through something else that allowed us to form a basis for a broad and solid foundation. End of quotation. Figures is a piano cycle comprised of 17 independent etudes. The etudes are connected thematically through both technical and musical aspects, whereby each one has its own focus. The idea for this cycle grew out of my work on the compendium of piano technique. Three years after publication of this book, these etudes were sketched out between 1998 and 1999. I finished them in the spring of 2006 in my sabbatical. I'm especially grateful for the inspiration of Claude Debussy's piano etudes. In both his etudes and his other piano music, Debussy combines compositional ideas with special technical possibilities for the piano and the keyboard in a uniquely symbiotic way. The term figure, figura in Latin, means form, image, or drawing. In dance or ballet, a figure represents a series of steps, which is why in Germany, corps de ballet dancers are also referred as to figuranten, <coughs> ones who make figures. In music, the use of the term figure refers to a group of tones or notes that belong together. As far back as antiquity, the term figura was based on the notion that a two-dimensional image, a three-dimensional sculpture, a chain of movements performed by a dancer when presented in choreography, and the musical figures that form a composition all mysteriously correlate. In other words, an aesthetic congruency exists between all of these processes. Around the turn of the 19th and 20th century, there evolved a synesthetic enthusiasm ignited by Richard Wagner, which spread most prolifically in France and had a great influence on composers such as Debussy and on authors and poets such as Baudelaire and Mallarmé. Debussy's poem composition, Rose Lyrique, is an example of these correspondences as well as his poetic statements that conclude his 24 preludes for piano. Spurred on by Schoenberg's example on his 12 tone theory, Kandinsky developed the first study of harmony for a new concept of painting that set the inner sound of colors and forms absolutely. Kandinsky was convinced that colors can be heard. 
Adolf Hölzl developed a comprehensive study of color and composition, which was to become the basis of the teachings of the Bauhaus movement. <coughs> In 1904, he explained, I imagine similarly to the study of counterpoint and harmony in music, painting too encompasses specific studies in every kind of contrast and ways of finding balance. These examples demonstrate the extent to which art, literature, and music have tried to discover and describe synthetic correlations in the early part of the 20th century all the way back to antiquity. My compendium of piano technique, which forms the theoretical foundation for the 17 choreographic etudes, represents a further building block among these attempts. I posit that an experienced piano teacher or pianist can recognize the sound a pianist produces by his movements, and conversely, can hear which series of movements he or she is making by the produced sound. In other words, every acoustic form of sound is aesthetically congruent with a visual movement form in its transformed state and vice versa. In the meantime, at the beginning of the 21st century, scientific research on some synesthetic characteristics of movement and music are giving this course of study some foundation, even if this is just the beginning of that movement. Sonification is just one example of this kind of research, which has been developed by the Bielefeld neuroscientist Thomas Herman. Herman has developed a sound design that translates brain frequencies during an epileptic attack exactly into a series of sound frequencies the human ear can differentiate. The ensuing frequencies are then reproduced using different instrumental sounds. The human ear is able to structure certain phenomena better than the eye. Of course, it would be also possible to produce these frequencies Visually. Edwin Gordon, a professor at the University of South Carolina, has drawn many important conclusions with regard to so called audiation. By carrying out numerous experiments dealing with auditive and pedagogical psychology, audiation is to music what thought is to literature. In other words, it is the phenomenon of hearing and understanding music even when a no physical sound is present. At the same time, we have to assume that the most important aspects of sound cannot be notated adequately. For example, spatial sound and movement. Form in space is to the fine arts what spatial sound movement is to music. We cannot walk or develop a feeling for rhythm without movement. If we do not have a feeling for space, we do not have a feeling for time. The brain cannot comprehend if it is not activated by the body. The brain counts the meter, the body fills space and time. These findings, proven by Gordon's many experiments, correlate with newest studies on the brain and the subconscious. One example is that the subconscious is able to signalize danger four to five times earlier than the conscious can with certainty, which is measurable by skin temperature and moisture. This evidence proves that it is an assumption of academic mental intelligence to take over all areas of music. Thus, body perception, condition, feeling are an important parameter of playing the piano and must be taken into consideration as an important part of creating differentiating sound. It is from this body feeling 
that an exceptional pianist develops multidimensional sound and is able to move beyond the commonly practiced simple and monotonous sound carpet to the use of a plethora of horizontal and vertical sound. To note, creating a sound carpet can in certain situations be a justified artistic tool, but the pianist's possibilities should not be limited by it. Additionally, all of these examples prove that technique and music represent a whole and that working on technique and movement figures is also always work and service to the music. In this context, it is very important to differentiate between technical and mechanical playing. Working on technique corresponds directly with producing sound, whereas working on mechanics is purely acrobatic. As you see, a choreographic sound exists. Furthermore, every sound could per se be considered as such. It is this choreographic sound that I am trying to find with my etudes based on the theoretical findings of my compendium of piano technique. The basic idea of the compendium and thus the 17 etudes are derived from the following discovery. The supposedly invisible orientation of music, the sound itself, is, as stated above, not really invisible, but rather manifests in the form of visual phenomena or movements that are executed at the instrument. Since, according to Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher of the 18th century, all of our senses offer enlightenment through experiences because our thinking always requires and creates an order in space and time, resulting in cause and consequence, music itself and the movement that belongs to it have an underlying order. Sound and the specific sound coloring produced at the piano are products of a movement that is executed by the pianist's body. This movement takes place over the course of a specific amount of time and the range of the movement depends on the amount of time available to the pianist. The amount of time the pianist has is dependent on the playing figure, the acoustics of the space, the mechanics of the instrument, and the amount of time it takes for the string to swing out after the initial impulse of the hammer striking it. The chosen playing tempo should be dependent on these parameters. Conversely, this is not possible for artistic reasons. The synthesis of all of these components and the way in which these components are brought into play with one another through dynamics, articulation, and use of the panel result in a specific aesthetic sound the pianist produces. Just as the fine arts try to create analogies about the sound quality of colors based on musical rules, giving art a temporal quality, in both my book and etudes, I try to create a comprehensive movement analogy and analysis that is meant to give music a spatial aspect. Taking these teachings to heart can simultaneously help the player avoid injuries and can potentially help heal injuries caused by dysfunctional movements. There are two major complexes whose individual components have been carefully observed, described and then put into context with one another in my companion. First, the player's body and its possibilities, which are all the joints and body parts from fingers to feet. This is the individual complex. The rules, second, the rules of gravity, construction of the keyboard, and the corresponding playing figures. This is the objective complex. 
Thus, my tunes include every possible movement for the joints and body parts relevant to playing the piano, while the fingering serve a flexible movement flow and support them, even if the fingerings may at first seem not plausible. And in turn, each possibility for the direction and combinations of movements is worked out. Compositionally, I have paid special attention to the ambivalent nature of the arrangement of the keyboard. The first is found in the arrangement of two blocks with three black keys and two black keys, as indicated in a typical Chopinesque hand position, with the second, third, and fourth fingers placed on F sharp, G sharp, and A sharp. This is the Chopin hand position. It has the three black keys in the middle, and the first finger and the fifth finger on the, on the white keys. This is a very comfortable position on the keyboard. It takes into consideration that we can see the keyboard as two, divided in two, um, in two areas. First, the, the area with three black keys, and second, the area with two black keys. It makes sense, of course, because if, if we only had white keys, it would be difficult for pianists to play. <laughs> if we had only black and white keys one next to each other, it would be difficult also. <coughs> the second way to view it, uh, the keyboard, is as a mirror image arrangement with mirror points in D or A flat respectively, leading to so-called key mirror sounds and mirrored plane figures, <coughs> as well as certain chord structures composed of black and white keys, all of which are called for in these etudes. Let me demonstrate this to you. We have one mirror image point on A flat. Uh, I, I really have talked to lots of pianists and many pianists don't know about it. This is incredible unless they are playing on this keyboard all the time. So this is a black key, two white keys, two black keys, white, white, black, white, black, white, white. It's completely mirror imaged. The other mirror image point would be D, natural, two black keys, white, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, white. So that leads to, if I play for example just a very easy, um, an easy example, I play E major in my right hand. It will be E, F sharp, G sharp, A, natural, B natural, C sharp, D sharp, and E. The mirror image point is D, so the exactly mirror image key that I would play would be A flat major starting from C, which would be C, B flat, A flat, G, F, E flat, D flat. Let me play this. It's just a very simple, simple example. I use these insights for my etudes to construct mirror imaged keys and chords, whatever. Um, this has nothing to do with, in this case also it has to do with with, uh, with intervals, but what I use is just the mirror image keys. So that's a completely different thing. In the process, I have made a special effort to find comfortable hand and sound positions among keys, avoiding purely constructionist symmetrical five-tone key images that are available. I did a little research on this. There are, there are for example, 23 um, uh, symmetrical five-tone positions on the piano keyboard. The Chopin position is one of these. Additionally, every relevant playing figure is musically woven into these attitudes in a variety of modifications. There was no question that I would use 
new avant-garde playing techniques such as plucking strings, using percussive sounds, and playing atten paying attention to overtone phenomena, all of which evoke a variety of effects that I have likewise combined and worked into a general context. From a physiological standpoint, it would be helpful if the foot pedals of the piano were further apart from one another, since this would encourage a more grounded sitting position. For my etudes, I hope someday such an instrument might be available. May instrument makers take this into consideration. <laughs> let, me show, let me show you this. Fred, is he here? Um, this position of the pedals here is a very unstable position for a pianist. It would be much better to have it like this. So that would be that the pedals are further apart from each other. I think it would be very easy to fix that. The utility of the etudes are not absolute in keeping with aforementioned findings. It is advisable to choose a slower rather than faster tempo. Only the first, which is already a slow etude, has a tempo marking indicating that it should not be played too slowly. In the introduction, the fingers deliberately follow the notes of different hand positions in, with white and black key combinations spanning one octave, using all 12 notes. The fingering is the basic fingering from my piano compendium, which unites every possible combination of two fingers within 20 touches of a fingering figure. In other words, each finger is used once before and once after any of the five fingers. At the same time, using this rule, before the same finger is used again, two other fingers must be placed. In turn, fingering combinations such as 1-3-1 one, one are avoided because of the back and forth motion within the hand. Contrary to the slow, rapid, repetitive movement without finger changes in the course of the first etude, the focus of the second one is placed on arm swings combined with active finger movements, while the third emphasizes arm vibrations and chord repetitions, and again in contrast, the fourth applies finger vibrations and single note repetitions with changing fingers. The fifth etude favors finger pull and finger push movements, in this etude, the articulations are exactly notated by rests. The sixth etude pays attention to the various possibilities of the isambi and arm pushes, the seventh to jumps. The eighth etude deals <coughs> arm circles combined with active fingers, the ninth practices core connections that carry the weight of the arm forward to the next notes or keys of the following chord, the tenth etude revolves around double turns, the eleventh around playing figures in intervals with a variety of arm movements. The twelfth etude consists primarily of alternating clusters. The thirteenth etude places the most emphasis on avant-garde playing techniques and arm weight exercises. The fourteenth etude shows crossing over of the hand and crossing under of the thumb for scales and arpeggios. The 15th etude is especially good for the practice of opening and closing the hand, as well as silent finger changes. The 16th etude helps finger circles, and finally, the 17th etude deals predominantly with drills and arm rotations. The central role of arm circles is addressed in most of these etudes by applying a variety of sound rotations. Numerous additional technical aspects of playing the piano, such as weight distribution changes within the hand, the passages of reverse developing dynamics, the splitting up of figures between hands, crossing over of the hands, various polyrhythmic motifs, etc., have of course also been addressed. The 17 choreographic etudes revolve around the, uh, the idea of the cycle. The use of light motifs and chords that operate throughout the etudes emphasize this thought. And yet, with all of the rationally calculated structures and findings, it is the music itself that represents the focal point, underlining the importance 
of spontaneous ideas, the unforeseen, and the associative quality of the unpredictable. The quest for a balance between the rational and irrational turns these attitudes into a synesthetic mirror image of the human philosophical quest for the equilibrium of mind and body, idea and realization, fantasy and real reality. I share this view with my friend Dr. Alfons Biermann, who has accompanied me throughout the creation of this work. That is why these pieces are dedicated to him. I would like to dedicate this world premiere to the late Professor George Robert. He was very interested in this project, but I felt always too embarrassed to play these etudes for him since they were not ready at that time. I'm sure he is with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.